Ever hear about the story of the way it all went down? Some sap beetles or something went and got in the corn. All mutating like, turn all the crops dead and kill everyone. That's how this all got started, but what's really interesting is what came next. The four moonshiners of the apocalypse, depending on if you believe the stories. Oh yeah? I love this one. Tell how it goes and how it kicked their butt. I'm pretty sure that's not what happened at all. How about we show them? Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer Kickstarter board game review. Today's game up on the tabletop is called Moonshiners of the Apocalypse. It's made by Too Fat to Fly Games, and it's for ages 14 and up, two to four players, and about an hour to two hours to play, depending on the number of players in the game. In the game Moonshiners of the Apocalypse, you're going to be playing as a moonshiner, those who make liquor, uh, during a post-apocalyptic uh, era in which the landscape has been decimated. You're going to head up to a town called Shantytown that is controlled by this kind of older curmudgeon guy who is willing to trade with you and whatnot, along with a bunch of drunkards, because what do you do during an apocalypse? You drink a lot. And so you're basically trying to make liquor. And unfortunately, you want to have those drunkards that are wandering around actually go onto your side and become citizens, but every round it gets more and more and more difficult because more and more people are drinking because you're making a lot of liquor. So, using Moonshiners of the Apocalypse is going to be basically a game in which you're going to be doing some, um, area control management, a little bit of building and a kingdom building design, as well as controlling your own character, and they all have their own unique bios, as well as the actions you can take on a turn. You can scavenge for resources, you can trade, you can go ahead and build buildings, and you can do a couple other things like moving on to different landscapes and whatnot. Uh, you're also able to drink liquor, of course, and that will help you along on your cause, and at the end of the game, if you have successfully gotten enough gold, you're going to be the winner. All right, let's go ahead and check it out. So here we have Moonshiners of the Apocalypse and everything that's coming into the game. This is a very large game, so we're going to start with this stuff over here. Firstly, you're going to be getting all different types of player pieces. You're going to be playing as either green, orange, white, or red, and each of these guys are going to have their own buildings for building locations on the board, as well as action tokens, and of course the trackers indicated on their scoreboards. Uh, you'll have that for every single player, as well as a big learn-to-play rulebook. You're also going to get tiles that are going to have different things on them, like workshops, saloons, cornfields, stills, etc etc where as you move around the boards when you start on the outskirts you're going to be discovering new tiles and of course you can go ahead and build things on there and of course then make liquor you've got gold tokens which is what you're trying to go for towards the end of the game you've got corn to make the, the liquor you've got scraps you can use to make buildings and you've got these grog here which can actually turn into other stuff as well it has a nice handy dandy chart which we'll talk about over here is the board and you're going to see booze and you're going to see drunkards and you're going to see relics there's three different types of cards the Relics, of course, being stuff like top hats, uh, rare uh, diamond pendants, purses, and whatnot. These are all things that are going to help you progressively um, uh, utilize these little pluses, these little bonuses here, which will be able to help you when you're fighting against the bad guys. These dice are going to roll, and you can get red or green, and these things will give you bonuses to green. So when you're fighting drunkards, it's very useful. You've got also these drunkards here, which is going to basically be utilizing these singular um, black tokens that you're going to put on the start of their health track, and it's going to go down. Uh, they have their own little bio, of course, and their health, and if you can defeat them, you're going to get different resources. The harder the uh, drunkard, the more difficult the drunkard, the more likely you're going to get scraps and whatnot, but you'll also be getting meeples, like these guys here, which you'll be placing on your buildings throughout the game. Finally, these are booze cards, and these ones here you're going to be uh, using, these will give you, oh, sorry, relics will give you bonuses to your uh, your scraps, so the, for each one relic, you'll get two scraps. For this one here, the booze, this is the where you get bonuses to your rolling when you're fighting against drunkards. It's basically who could ever outdrink the other person. In. There is a first player token and of course a die to indicate uh, different things happening on the board and where things are going to spawn. And then the big large board which will also have an indication of the rounds on it. Over here are all the different characters in the game. You've got something like this guy here is Benny Whitaker. You've got Alfred, you got Marla, and you got Samuel Connery. They all have their own unique bios and of course their liquor tracker. They've got their stamina and their uh, inebriation and if these guys ever hit you're going to basically black out. These are all the different actions 
actions you can take and how many times you can take them throughout a round. Active booze crate, which is all the things you can you can basically hold an active booze. Uh, and once that runs out, you have to put a new one down. And then over here, characters. These are all going to be the uh, crazy drunkards and whatnot, along with the characters in the game that you can go ahead and choose. Finally, over here, you have the box of the for the game and these cards here, which basically is an indication of what you need in order to can be considered one singular gold. So uh, eight scraps makes four corn. Four corn makes four uh, is is, a con is basically conversely related to four relics, which is two moonshine, which is one gold. Whoever has the most gold at the end of the game is the winner. So that's very important to keep track of. These are all the different uh, drunkards in the game. They're going to spawn and be moving around the board. But for the most part, that is the components of the game moonshiners of the apocalypse. Let's go ahead and talk about how turns work. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about the round of play as long as well as a player turn. And it's handy because you have this little uh, card here which tells you how it works. Now the first thing you're going to do is pick a player to start with and put everybody on the outside of the board. I'll show setup down below in a second here. Let's just go through a turn though. So if it's not the first turn of the game, you're going to have to pass the first player marker to your left. And then people are going to be taking two actions. Everybody will take two actions in a row. And then everybody's going to take two more actions in a row. Actions are as follows. You can move to a, a hex. And, and movement isn't based on adjacent. You can just move wherever you want. There are certain uh, rules to how movement works. You can't go across an empty tile to another tile. But for the most part, you just move around the board. Uh, of course, you can scavenge for resources. You'll be using these uh, resource die here. You can get relics and you can get scraps. You're simply going to roll them and collect. You can go ahead and construct a building. So if there is a uh, hex up on, on the board, you can spend eight resources or eight scraps, I believe. And then you can put a house on here. And of course, they don't do anything unless you have survivors, which is what you're going to do by acquiring um, them from defeating drunkards. So you're going to challenge drunkards as another action. That is simply going to be rolling these five drunkard dice, or these, uh, I guess you would call it like inebriation dice. And you want to get more greens than reds. Reds means you're going to be taking damage or be basically becoming more inebriated. And green means you're going to make them more inebriated. They have a little tracker for each of the drunkards. And if you can make them go uh, kaput before yourself, you're going to score survivors and possibly even scraps. Then you can go ahead and also trade with Uncle Harding. He's basically the, he's the shantytown mayor, a <laughs> self-elected. He's in the middle of the board and you can go ahead and trade stuff with him based on this little trading chart here, along with a bunch of other stuff. You can collect relics, you can uh, buy booze. Uh, there's just a bunch of different things he can do. Uh, after that is a night phase. After everybody takes two, two, two actions and then two more actions, then you go to the night phase and that's survivors become drunkards. So if there's any drunkards on a space that has survivors, one of them will become a drunkard. Production, so every, all of your buildings will produce based on the number of survivors and buildings that are on them. And then you're going to redistribute the uh, uh, the survivors however you want as long as you have on the board you can redistribute them how you would like then drunkards are going to move and there are movement dice these guys here for each of the different type of survivors you're going to roll them in order from the weakest to the strongest and of course if the roll doesn't make sense it doesn't work you have to re-roll it again you can never have more than one drunkard on a single space uh, then new drunkards will arrive and that's based on the number of players in the game along with how far the game has progressed usually it's like x equals number of players plus one, two, and three, depending on how far in the game is, or seven rounds of the game. Then you're going to advance the hot air balloon token across the uh, from, from one space to the next, from seven to six, six to five, so on and so forth, to get to the last round in which no more drunkards will spawn at that time, and that's one more round of play. Whoever has the most gold at the end of the game is the winner, these little gold tokens here, and that is the basic idea. Let me show you a setup of the game, as well as a couple turns, and uh, showing you basically what the actions you can do and all that kind of stuff, because there's a lot going on, and it'll take a while a round of play. So I'll just show you the basics that you need to know how to play the game Moonshiners of the Apocalypse. So here we have a fully set up game for the game Moonshiners of the Apocalypse. I went ahead and set up for two players just to get a good idea of what the board's going to look like. Have your three decks of cards over here shuffled and put into the three separate areas. It tells you exactly where they need to go. Make sure your turn tracker is on seven. This is supposed to be a hot air balloon, but I can't seem to find it. So we're just going to use this tracker every round. It's just going to go down to the last round. And uh, you can go ahead and set your characters out on any side of the board that you want outside of the uh, little hexagon tiles. Right here is going to be your trading area with your uh, shanty town leader. I went ahead and set up all the other guys over here, all the tokens over here as well. Make sure you look at your player board over here. You have your four actions here. Your stamina is going to start at the heart. Your, your inebriation is going to start at the other heart. And you're also going to have your uh, drinking track right here. Just set that there. Whenever you put a card down on the boozy area, you're going to go ahead and move it based on the... Um, 
the amount it has on it. Okay, and then of course your die, which is going to be used to spawn things. So let's go ahead and begin and explain. Now the first thing you're going to want to do is uh, pass the player marker if it's not the first turn, which it is the first turn. So just going to go ahead and give this to Samuel Connery over here. Also note they each have their own special ability. This guy here gets to um, t multiply the die roll of the lowest uh, scrap roll. So this shows you the different. Here, this is scrap times two, the lowest die roll. And then over here, this guy, whenever he flips over a tile, he's going to get plus two scrap. In general, you're going to get a relic though when you flip over a tile. So then we're going to go ahead and take actions. He can go ahead and start first. He can take his actions. And the first thing he might want to do is go ahead and uh, move and flip a tile over. He can go ahead and move and pick any of these tiles here and flip it over. Take this guy. Then he'll flip over this tile here. This is a still. And of course, it has a one and two level. On the first level, guys can get scraps if there's a house here, depending on the number of survivors. And then on the second level, for a corn spent for each survivor, you can go ahead and get grog. He'll move here. When Whenever you flip over a tile, you're going to be getting a relic here. So this guy will get that. And of course, relics are going to give you the ability to get scraps. So whenever you trade them in to this guy here, it's going to be two times the number of um, the number over here. So in this case, you get four scraps, which is half of what you need for a house. So that's pretty useful. These are to remain secret or hidden. That's one action. He gets to take another action. Maybe he'll choose to use his scavenging action, which means he's going to roll all these scavenging dice. It doesn't matter where you roll. Um, you're just going to go ahead and take these dice and roll them up and bam here we go so we have two four that's a great roll seven scrap and two relics so we're gonna go ahead and take our, our scrap here we got four two and a one that's seven scrap and then of course two relic cards so let's go ahead and take these guys here and that's going to give him additional stuff there's basically two scraps for each of these guys uh, that's his two actions after he's done his two actions he's going to go ahead and pass and the next player is going to get to go as well uh, this player is probably also going to move, so we'll just go ahead and move this guy into here. Flip over this. It's a saloon. Saloons are great because they're going to give you scrap for each person there. And at the second level, they're going to give you grog, depending on the number of uh, meeples you have. Up to four, of course, that's the max. Uh, four meeples, if you trade in one grog, you can get three gold. Pretty useful. Don't forget to draw that relic card. Uh, after that, then he's going to take another action. What does he want to do? Now, normally, there's the actions to build, of course, and there is to fight the drunkards or out drink the drunkards. But currently, there's no drunkards on the board so maybe another option would be pretty simple yet again to go ahead and take a scavenging roll oh not the drunkard dice take these guys here and roll them and then he's going to uh, add the total up of course nah, no good um and 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 he'll take whatever is needed also, don't forget, too, he did flip over tiles. So that is going to also net him two scraps just for doing that. That's his special ability. And then he would take two more actions as well. He would take two more actions as well. And it's going to be based on the numbers of actions. So you can only scavenge once per round. You can only move three times. You can trade twice, or you could uh, build four times, or you could fight twice. So remember, you can't have you can't scavenge more than once. So let's say he went ahead and moved two more times. So we'll just go ahead and open the board up here. Uh, just just because right so we're just moving the game along to show you what happens after this and this guy also went ahead and uh, moved two more times and let's open the board up a little more bam like that and like that okay so he went back he moved then he went back and he moved and then we're going to go on to the next stage which is going to be survivor uh, survivors become drunkards so if there's any survivors on the board and there are drunkards on the board then those guys will turn into drunkards as well. So in this case, if there's two guys here and of course a, a house, then then uh, one of these guys would go and another drunkard would spawn. If that's not the case, like the first round here, then nothing is going to spawn. After that, the production phase, so everything that has houses and meeples on it, is going to spawn based on the production rates that entail on the cards. Redistribution of survivors, so if there's multiple survivors on one area, you can move them from one to another to, to, uh, so that you actually have houses on them already. You can't simply move them on locations that are empty. After you do that, the... Um, the drunkards are going to move if they can you'll be taking these die here and uh, in order from weakest to strongest there's crazy sad and angry drunks and those guys are going to move based on these die it's pretty simple how they work northwest northwest north southwest so on and so forth there's all six of the different directions here and then you're going to spawn drunkards and you're simply going to do that by um taking this die here right and rolling it along with picking a drunkard up and it's going to be uh, based on the number of players uh, for these rounds here and then the next one's plus one and then plus two 
Uh, so this guy here is Conan the Librarian. He's a big scary guy. Take this, and this says one, so you're going to look at the board here and find number one, and just place the guy there. And then we're going to get another guy out. Uh, this is the foul mouth Bishop. He's also got one, and if that happens, they are simply on the same space. They can't do that, so you have to re-roll it. Three, that'll work. And let's see, where's three? Right here. Perfect. He's done. Whenever you spawn these guys here, you're also going to want to make sure you keep track of their health. Simply put the uh, black markers on the highest point of health for them. And after the spawning of the drunkards is done, advance the air balloon token to the next round. You'd simply go ahead and do this, and players would continue again. So, now you understand the basics of the game, let's talk about how you're going to go through building. So if, let's say this guy wanted to trade for his next round, so he could trade all of these things here, and that's going to net him eight scraps. So his next action would be to uh, trade. It goes there. As long as he has got an adjacent spot to get to here, he can do that. Uh, he can get rid of all these guys here, and that will net him his scraps that he needs. And there we go, just like that. And on his next action, he can get rid of the eight scraps, and he can uh, build a building uh, that he wants to be on. Uh, then be this one right here. Uh, he can also choose to, if he wanted to, be able to fight a bad guy. Now, he, he can actually, um, he, he can't be on the same space as these guys. You just have to be adjacent to do so, and you're simply going to roll dice. So we'll take these five dice here, and you're going to simply roll them. And then, so this red means damage to yourself. Green means you're damaging them. So if he was fighting this green guy here, he would take one damage, and you would take one, two, three, and four. And of course, to attack, you have to spend your stamina from one to three to six to ten. Um, and then to continue fighting, which is, of course, probably what he'll want to do. He'll need to go ahead and do it again. He'll move his stamina down. He'll roll these dice here. And then he's got three more reds. One, two, and three. And then he's got two of these uh, greens. That's one and two. Do it again. Goes to six here. Rolls the dice. Uh, three damage, which will knock this guy out but he'll then take two more damage. Now he has to be careful because if he wants to go to here, it's going, it'll be really, really close and you're actually can like basically lose a turn if you get inebriated. So you gotta be careful with that. How you can avoid that though is by going to this guy and trading for with scraps and it can replenish your stamina and of course your inebriation level, which is important to do throughout the game. Otherwise it will reset on its own, but you really don't want that to happen because it's a, at a big cost. Destroying these guys here, depending on the type of them, is going to net you scraps as, and other things, but mainly it's going to net you people. And those people will actually just go on your board. So in the actual game, these are not going to be on the board. And whenever you uh, kill a, or defeat a drunkard, you're going to turn them into survivors, in which case you can then put them on a location that has a house so that during the production phase, you can score different things. Like for instance, in the production phase, I have two meeples here. Uh, each meeple will produce one scrap for me. So that's pretty useful there as well, right? Um, then, and that's the basic idea. You're gonna continue and you can actually go ahead. Oh, sorry. Building, the first building is four, building the second building is eight. So it's important to remember that's four and then eight. Uh, so an additional four to get your second building out there. And it's also gonna cost you an additional building action. And these all work together in different ways. For instance, uh, maybe you want to convert, I don't know, um, there's there's like cornfields and whatnot. Uh, they're gonna, so this, this thing here can produce corn. And then you can find stuff where I think corn can produce grog, which is this one here. And then you can make the grog into gold. So that is a way to do that. You can also trade up and trade down uh, to get different resources as well. Uh, and, not, and not only that, but you're also going to be using these booze things, which you can go ahead and buy from him. Uh, what, what happens is you're basically going to spend three scraps after you draw five cards. For each uh, three scraps you spend, you can take these guys into your hand, and then you can utilize them on your side of the board, and they're going to give you bonuses for fighting. Once uh, you put it over here in your little action area, uh, you, and after every single time you roll, you move this down, and eventually this will get removed from the game, but it'll give you plus three to your green rolls. So if this was the roll, it would actually be plus six as a, uh, and, two, and, and minus two health. So six damage to the bad guy and two damage to yourself. So these things will be very useful. There's other actions as well that take place. The game's going to continue going through rounds until you get to the last round of the game in which drunkards will not spawn. And if that happens, uh, well, when that happens, everybody's then after going to finish the round and tally up all of the gold. You're also going to convert all the stuff on your board, whether it be scraps or, or different relics and whatnot, into gold. And whoever has the most is the winner of the game. And that's the basic idea for Moonshiners of the Apocalypse. Let's come up and talk about it. So let's talk about a couple caveats for the game. Now, the first thing is I mentioned that you get uh, four and then eight, but it's actually when you construct buildings, you're going to start off by spending four for the first level, and then it's going to cost you an additional action 
construction and you're going to spend four more for the second level, which means you're gonna need two houses and a total of eight for two levels on a platform. Not only that, but during the production phase, when you're converting things and producing things, you can choose the order in which you want to produce things and how you want to do it. So that way you can kind of stack uh, Stack your production into your favor. Make the corn, turn the corn into booze, turn the booze into gold. And instead of any other way, try and make it the best rape possible for you. Always remember to utilize the weapons if you can, the booze from buying from uh, the guy in the middle. He's going to give you the ability to basically fight these guys easier. Another thing to note too is during production phase when you have drunkards on locations that you're basically creating resources, they're going to halt your production in that area. So it's best to try and take those guys out if you think they're going to move there. Uh, sometimes you're going to get unlucky and they're just going to spawn there and there's no, or they're going to be, they're, sometimes you can just get unlucky based on how they move. But for the most part, you can kind of try and figure out where they're going to be going based on how many they're on the board. And also at the end of the game, they just get really, really crazy because more and more of them are going to spawn based on the amount of liquor everyone is producing. So thematically that works works really well. So let's go ahead and talk about a couple of the cards first, and then we'll go ahead and get into what I think about it. Uh, you have stuff like Absinthe and other types of basic booze that is going to basically give you the ability to fight, that you're going to use, uh, utilize it for plus one, plus two, or plus three, based on your die rolls for these green and red dice. They're really good for using in combat. You have stuff like Have One On Me, which basically uh, negates your opponent's roll, or it negates the bad guy's attack on you when you roll the dice. You're going to have stuff like Aspirin, which will give you bonus health, and other things similar to that. Relic are going to go from one to or zero to three and sometimes you'll get lucky and you'll get something that's a or sorry yeah sometimes you get something like a coffee tin which is very useful other times you're gonna get something like the good book which doesn't really help you in the apocalypse unfortunately at least for this game yeah, golden molar is worth zero nevertheless i guess it is uh and that's the basics of all the different cards of course there's three different types of drunks the red ones are going to give you additional uh scraps and then I think the, the more difficult they are, they're going to give you different things. You can look at the rulebook, it has how that works. But the scarier, the bigger the guys are, the more likely they're going to give you bonuses. But every single one of them is going to produce two survivors for you to put on the board. You can put them on pretty much whenever you want, as long as you have the locations controlled. You can never have more than one guy in a space. Okay. That being said, what do I think about Moonshiners? Well, this game is kind of an area control slash like worker placement euro -y game. It has that combat aspect where you are rolling dice. There's a bit of luck involved in that. You have the movement, which kind of messes around with the drunkards are going to go. But thematically, that really works because sometimes people are going to be out drinking you. Sometimes you're going to, depending on your tolerance, you know, it's all that kind of stuff kind of works with these dice. I like that aspect of the game. The way they move is kind of random, but that works because they're kind of drunk and they don't know really where they're going and more and more spawn throughout the game. And that makes sense as well because you're creating distillery is along with everybody else. So the more booze in the apocalypse, the more likely people are going to be drunk and also turning other people into drunkards as well. You're going to have crazy, sad, and angry drunks, so that all makes sense. And then your objective is to score gold. And that's important because at the end of the game, there's an air balloon. And it's going to take the person who's the most, uh, who is the richest of, of the bunch of you guys. And uh, yeah, you know, they only want the rich to go to the high society, the non-apocalyptic uh, area, leaving everybody in the dust. <laughs> to defend with, with all the drunkards that they basically created. You've basically made a, uh, a hellhole of your own making. Um, the Also, the, the locations actually work really well because there's different routes you can go to how you want to build onto the buildings. You don't necessarily need to be building to win the game. You can do other things like just simply... Um, I mean, it's really important. Building is... Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. It's really important. But it's not the most important thing. There's... there's like, well... It's not the only important thing in the game. Scavenging is going to helping, help you, making sure you go and uh, talk to the guy in the middle to score different cards and whatnot is going to help you. Uh, at the end of the game, the idea is just gold. However you want to convert it is, is the most important thing. And I would suggest always to build buildings. I would always suggest that scavenging role. I think it's very, very powerful. And uh, I would also suggest to make sure that you pick certain um, tiles that are going to benefit you and they have their own, like, you want to structurize them. So you want you want your corn to turn into grog, to turn into gold. That's that's the main one I really like in the game. Um, and all the rest of the cards are just kind of random. The booze, you don't know what you're going to get from, from the booze. And the relic cards, these are just like a teddy bear all the way up to like uh, a top hat, you know? Um, I really like this game. It's really fun. I enjoy the uh, thematic element of the game, which kind of brings it more interest, entertaining to me. The more game, more players you have in this game, the more fun it's going to be because the board's going to get more and more crowded and more things are going to happen. It basically turns into this crazy zany style worker placement. Two players was actually pretty fun as well. I really enjoyed that. I played it two and four players and they both worked out really well. I didn't have a problem with either one. Um, 
the, the, the rules are very simple to understand. I didn't have any confusion as far as that goes, but then again, maybe I messed up something here. This is a Kickstarter game, so until everything's finalized, take my words with a grain of salt. But overall, the theme, I like the uh, images, all the artwork is fun. It's kind of this like gloomy slash, slash com comedic uh, game. I mean, you got this guy here. It says, people around me were dropping like flies, but somehow I survived. And they're stupid enough to in double time, you got waxed before they could say hallelujah. Well, I'm not in the business of changing the world. <laughs> like, just really cool. And they all have their own special abilities. None of them are more powerful than the other. They all have their own uses. And depending on what you want to build or what you want to do in the game is which one you're going to want to pick. But overall, it works very well. It's balanced. If you like your worker placement, if you like a little bit of uh, chance involved as well in your worker placement, and also some area control, it's probably a game you should definitely check out. I would suggest it down in the description below on Kickstarter, Moonshiners of the Apocalypse. What do you think? All right, guys. Thanks for watching another Unfiltered Gamer Kickstarter board game review. If you like this video, go check out our videos on YouTube. Like, subscribe, and comment. It all helps. We do greatly appreciate it, as well as checking out Moonshiners of the Apocalypse in the description below. Make some booze and try and get the most gold so you can escape the apocalypse landscape, escape, and leave all of your other buddies alone to fend off all the crazy drunks that they have made. <laughs> Sucks to be them. Also, go ahead and check our website, unfilteredgamer.com. We're currently going to be in the way of Flanks. Uh, Flanks is a two-player dexterity card game. It is fun and very, it's, it's a very enjoyable, quick game. Uh, I would suggest checking it out. It's free. Wait, 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 what do you want, right? Uh, as well as checking out everythingboardgames.com and the Giveaway Geek, two great sites. You can do a lot of giveaways as well. All right, guys, that's all I got for this time. And as always, I love you. I love you so much. Go ahead and build me some, uh, some moonshine, some grog. I'd appreciate that. I'll see you next time.